Unlike anyone else in Year Street 1, Winston Smith seems to understand that he might be happier if he were free. He watches others and tries to blend in, tries to conceal his unpardonable desire for freedom. However, he has committed deadly thought crime. Being a peculiar individual in this totalitarian state, he can't resist the urge to rebel. In writing in the diary, he becomes a thought criminal and considers himself doomed from the very start. This is the Two Minutes Hate, a daily routine that arouses people's hatred against enemies from other states and their love for their supreme leader, Big Brother. Winston notices two other party members, O'Brien and the dark-haired girl. He has dreamed about O'Brien since decades ago. Winston knows that O'Brien must be a rebel, because he told him in the dreams. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. As for the dark-haired girl, Winston hates her although he has never spoken to her. She's young, beautiful, vigorous, but Winston knows she's also the most loyal adherent of the party. She's the most enthusiastic during the two minutes hate, and she wears a scarlet sash of junior anti-sex league around her voluptuous waist. Sex is merely a procreative duty whose end is the creation of new party members. The party channels people's frustration and emotions into ferocious hatred against the party's enemies. Winston is aroused by Julia's beauty, but disgusted by her fervor. And this is Oceania, controlled by a communist government with absolute power. The party monitors and controls every aspect of human life, to the extent that even having a disloyal thought is against the law. The cities are dilapidated, people are starving, food is scarce. But the party ensures that every single home has a telescreen which blasts a constant stream of propaganda and monitors party members' behavior. There are no more families, absolutely no love in marriage, only kids spy on their parents ready to report any words of disloyalty. There is no more truth, the party controls every source of information, managing and rewriting the content of all newspapers and histories for its own needs. There is no more independent thought. The new speak language structures and limits the ideas people are capable of formulating. And most certainly, there's no more humanity. Everything characteristic of human race has been stripped off of the party members. But there's hope. Proles, the working class, live in their own filthy and impoverished district. However, not shackled by telescreens or newspeak. They have the most precious possession. Freedom. To the party, they are animals, but on the contrary, they live like real humans. They marry for love, they work for family, they seek pleasure in recreation. They hold the key to the past because nothing can change their unintelligent, stubborn mind. They hold the key to the future, because nothing can erase their primitive human nature. Winston desires love, companionship, and freedom. And to his surprise, he finds him in the last person he would expect. The dark-haired girl, Julia. Under her obedient facade is a restless heart for rebellion and pleasure. Unlike Winston, Julia is not so speculative about the party. He accepts the party and her life for what it is. Her relationship with Winston changes the nature of Winston's rebellion. From a timidly rebellious party member to a reckless criminal, Winston has transformed himself to a more sensible, humane individual. Then, with the company of Julia, Winston meets O'Brien in his apartment. The meeting is brief, but it establishes O'Brien as an animatic powerful figure. He is the embodiment of everything Winston hoped he would be. Winston unconditionally accepts the terms of the brotherhood, and without a doubt, believed in O'Brien. The future is promising. Winston has found a loved one to whom he has vowed to never betray, and the presence of the brotherhood also overthrows the party's absolute control.
When Julia and Winston embraced each other in the sunset, a voice came from behind. You are the dead. In the Ministry of Love, where punishment and correction take place, Winston meets O'Brien in a place where there's no darkness, his prison cell. O'Brien, however, is not his comrade, but his torturer. The hope and optimism he inspires in Winston is part of the psychological torture Winston suffers. After the mental breakdown, O'Brien proves that physical pain can override humanity. Throughout the torture session, Winston becomes increasingly eager to believe anything O'Brien tells him, even 2 plus 2 equals 5. At last, when facing a writhing storm of rats prepared to devour his face, Winston betrayed Julia. His betrayal marks the success of the party's correction and the futility of Winston's attempt to rebel. In the very last chapter, Winston totally surrenders to the party, sitting in the Chestnut Tree Cafe where political criminals gather and wait for their execution. Winston whispers, he loves Big Brother. After all, 1984 isn't about Winston's rebellion or tragic love. The character of Winston serves to represent the effect of the party's total control over a human being. The objects and people around Winston symbolizes different conflicts. Big Brother is the party in its public manifestation, or reassurance to most people. But to Winston, he is more of a threat as there is no way to escape from his overwhelming gaze. The omnipresent telescreens are the most direct symbol of the party's constant monitoring of its subject. Through propaganda and bombardment of political information, the party deprives people of their ability to think. It symbolizes how totalitarian government abuses technology for its own end instead of exploiting its knowledge to improve civilization. The glass paperweight, an artifact that Winston bought in the Pearl District, symbolizes the past that can't be altered by any force. In buying the paperweight, Winston attempts to reconnect with the past. However, this magical thing that seems to possess the power of preserving the past is eventually destroyed by the Thought Police. All in all, Orwell portrays the perfect totalitarian society, the most extreme realization imaginable of a modern-day government with absolute power, to warn readers in the West of the dangers of totalitarianism. Orwell portrays a perfect. Orwell portrays a perfect. Or... Orwell portrays a perfect totalitarian government. Orwell portrays a perfect total. Orwell portrays a perfect. Orwell portrays a perfect. After all, 1984 isn't about Winston's rebellion or tragic love. The character of Winston serves to represent the effect of the party's total control over a human being. The objects and pe- <laughs> Orwell portrays the perfect totalitarian society. <laughs>